moving on to tonight's uh, guests, we are so thrilled to have these three figures who are contributing so much to the conversation of uh, what is inside the male brain. Uh, Michael Kimmel is one of the world's leading experts on men and masculinities. He is the SUNY Distinguished Professor of Sociology and Gender Studies at Stony Brook University. Among his many books are Manhood in America, Angry White Men, which is on sale in our bookshop tonight, also, The Politics of Manhood, The Gendered Society, and the bestseller, Guyland, The Perilous World Where Boys Become Men. With funding from the MacArthur Foundation, he founded the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities at Stony Brook in 2013. A tireless advocate of engaging men to support gender equality, Kimmel has lectured at more than 300 colleges, universities, and high schools. He has delivered the International Women's Day Annual Lecture at the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the Council of Europe, and has worked with the ministers for gender equality of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden in developing programs for boys and men. He consults widely with corporations, NGOs, and public sector organizations on gender equity issues. He has recently been called, quote, the world's most prominent male feminist in the Guardian newspaper. Professor Geraldine Downey's main interest is the study of personal and status-based rejection. In her current work, she is exploring people's expectations of rejection and their impact on the perception of other people's behavior and anticipation of and following social encounters. Her work has focused on the personality disposition of rejection sensitivity and on, and on its association with the responses to rejection as well as efforts made to prevent it. This line of work has led her to study sensitivity to rejection based on personal, unique characteristics, as well as sensitivity to rejection based on group characteristics such as race and gender. She has sought to investigate the effect of rejection sensitivity on people's behavior by utilizing various techniques, including established social cognition paradigms, experimental studies, physiological recordings, brain imaging, and diary studies. Recently, Dr. Downey has been using the knowledge acquired from her research on rejection to develop models of personality and attachment disorders. She has also been interested in the study of identity, specifically on the way in which individuals use their multiple social identities strategically to cope with daily stressors. And moderating tonight uh, is Alexis Grinnell, a co-founder of Pythia Public, uh, who works on issue campaigns and policy for both elected officials and non-governmental actors and organizations. She has worked at the city, state, and national levels on a variety of issues, including campaign finance reform, redistricting, affordable child care, paid leave, election reform, immigration, and domestic workers' rights. She got her start working in politics over a decade ago, writing a monthly column for the last seven years. Grinnell writes regularly in the New York Daily News, and her work has appeared in the Washington Post, The Nation, Newsday, The New York Post, The Daily Beast, City and State, and El Diario. She also appears on New York One's Inside City Hall with Errol Lewis and WNYC's The Brian Lair Show, among others. She serves as a board member at large for Hollaback and has advised the Knight Foundation on civic tech and media proposals. A graduate of the University of Chicago, Grinnell also holds an MPA in urban policy from Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. I leave it to the three of you. All right. Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, everyone. So let's get right to it. Um, I feel that uh, it's sort of appropriate to start with a bit of an anecdote that's extremely relevant. Uh, this morning, when I was promoting this event on Twitter, I uh, immediately got actually by what I would call, and what I think Michael would call an angry white man, who explained to me that toxic masculinity was an asinine concept. <laughs> and that it was in fact made up by people who don't have a positive view of masculinity and don't particularly like men. He's incidentally John Riley, the court reporter at Newsday, and don't at me, John. <laughs> so anyway, I thought though it was perhaps would be a clarifying exercise for all of us to do some, um, go over some definitions. So I'd love to turn it to Michael and ask him to tell us what is toxic masculinity. Um, first of all, let me just say, uh, hello fellow Brooklynites. Um, <laughs> this is really a, a, a delight for me to be here. Um, and. Uh, so, and, and you know, I want, what I want to say about the angry white man, John, who, um, who uh, you know, sort of trolled you on, on Twitter, is um, I basically don't use the term toxic masculinity precisely because it always elicits that kind of response. Hmm. Um, 
I find that many people, when they hear the idea of toxic masculinity, several things happen, one of which is we get the, 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 um, the comparison between toxic masculinity and healthy masculinity, by which many men give themselves a pass. I'm healthy, I'm okay, never committed rape, we're all good. And, and I, I often think of that as kind of a premature self-congratulation. Um, then the second, so, I'll wait for that one to ripple back. <laughs> um, okay, so, so, but this, so what I do, what I would like us to think about instead of toxic, healthy, which parts are which, um, as if the animal itself has a, may have a disease that needs to be cured, mm -hmm. I'd like to th us to think about it a little bit differently. So a few months ago, I was at West Point and I was doing the, their annual sexual assault awareness lecture. And I asked the cadets at West Point, what does it mean to be a good man? You know, what are the values, ideas, the things that come into your head when you, see, when, you, when you hear the idea? You wake up in the morning and you look at yourself and you say, you're a good man, what does that mean? Well, of course, the cadets at West Point being cadets at West Point, the first thing they said was honor, uh -huh. duty, country, sacrifice. Then they went into responsibility, um, provider, protector, do the right thing, stand up for the little guy. I said, okay, that's great, that's what it means. Um, where'd you get that idea? And they looked at me like, well, it's everywhere. It's Homeric, it's Shakespearean, it's the Judeo-Christian heritage, it's everything in our culture. I say, okay, fine. And by the way, everyone in this room already recognizes that what they said it means to be a good man is what it means to be a good person, mm -hmm. right? But the guys did see this as a deeply gendered, uh, a, you know, sort of phenomenon nonetheless. So I said to them then, okay, that's what it means to be a good man. Tell me if any of those ideas come up for you when I say, man the fuck up, be a real man. And they say, oh no, no, that's completely different. Well, what does that mean? Be strong, be tough, never show weakness, never cry, play through pain, suck it up, get rich, get laid, etc." <laughs> and so I said, well, where did you learn that? And in order, they said, my father, my coach, my guy, my, my guy friends, my older brother. So I thought, okay, that's interesting. Let's take good man and real man, put them next to each other, and here's what I think we, we, we can use this as a frame hmm. to, it, to replace the toxic healthy. Here's why. Because what I'm trying to say is I believe, if you think about that, the homosociality of, of being a real man, that, real, that other men are constantly policing you, judging you, per, watching your performance, that's what the real man is, everybody's watching you, judging you, so what I know about every man in this room is that we have all at one point in our lives been asked to betray our own values about what it means to be a good man in order to avoid the, the violence that could come from betraying being a real man to other guys. That's the story I think we have to tell our, that's the story as a father. I would love to tell my son how awesome I am. What I have to do is tell him the, the time that I did that, wow. the time I betrayed my own values, the cost to that, because it will cost you when you do that. When you, you know, when you, uh, when you don't see what you see, when you don't say something about what you see, when you don't intervene about what you see, it will cost you. You can't look at yourself the next day in the same way and say, what a good man you are. So, so I think this is the conversation. So our topic is the male brain. I think this conversation is going on in men's brains all the time, where we know what's right, and we know where, what it means to be good, and on the other hand, we also know the pressures not to be. So my, so my answer to this, th th this question is, not how can I cure you of your toxicity to make you healthy, but how can I support you in living up to your values about what it means to be a good man. Well, that is, I think, a wonderfully comprehensive expanded definition. I'm going to suggest here that, and I'm gonna bring in Geraldine and her research, that part of what motivated John today to speak out, to attempt to sort of put me in my place, is that the script has been flipped by Me Too. Mm -hmm. We see this centering of women's voices and experiences wherein they were previously um, absent 
from the sort of mainstream narrative. And this is where I think this, this strategy of self-silencing that we've read so much in a lot of the Me Too coverage, well, why didn't these women say anything before? Like, why didn't they just stand up to the patriarchy and like kick ass? As if that's just, you know, standing up to centuries of structural sexism is a snap. So what's interesting to me is I thought John's reaction was in many ways a reaction to being asked to be silent mm -hmm. in a space where men are used to speaking up and feeling ownership of space that they are now being told is not just for them. So I wanted to sort of talk about the way in which that script is getting flipped. Both of you have written about this. Yeah. And maybe, Geraldine, you can talk a little bit about what self-silencing is in women and what it is in men. So the work that I've been doing uh, for a long time is looking at how people uh, respond, both men and women, in anticipation of rejection, and how they silence themselves or do the kind of things that they think will stop the rejection from happening. Uh, the rejection can be very painful. Uh, it can be from somebody that they uh, are deeply attached to. Or I think what uh, in the work that I've done on women in uh, institutions from which they've been historically excluded, and particularly the group that I've studied is women uh, entering law school uh, and entering other institutions of, of, of um, higher education. Uh, what, it's actually with your colleague Benita London at uh, yeah. Stony Brook. Uh, what, what we've done is looked at this idea that that people censor themselves. Uh, they don't say what's on their mind uh, because they feel that they won't get what they want. Um, and that, that if they ask for a pay raise, if they ask to be a member of a group uh, that they want to be part of, um, that that will make them get put in their place. And they're not wrong. This is what traditionally uh, happens to groups who feel that their acceptance uh, in institutions of, uh, of, uh, that are powerful, or even in families uh, where, they, uh, where they feel that they're not the, the, the uh, uh, preferred person, that they feel that they're conditionally accepted, and that the condition of their acceptance is keeping quiet. Something has changed. Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, and with, the, with the, the Me Too movement, um, I think that even in my generation um, of uh, women in academia, we stayed quiet, but not necessarily uh, being concerned about sexual harassment, but being on the margins of not, not getting the kind of positions that we uh, uh, saw other people getting and, 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 and the, the opportunities to, to uh, move up in the... Uh, um, uh, in the hierarchy. But my sense is that you know, one of the things that uh, was a huge wake-up call to women generally was the treatment of Hillary Clinton in, uh, in the election. Whether people wanted to, uh, for her, uh, her to be president or not, uh, there was something about the way that she was treated uh, that um, uh, I think made many of us feel uh, that if we uh, didn't continue to stay silent, uh, we would never um, uh, be accepted. But if we did continue to stay silent, uh, that we would be still kept in our place mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, forever. And that what you saw um, not directly uh, from, from the Hillary Clinton uh, uh, those of us of, of, of that era. Um, but but a, a, a response from younger women saying that they're not willing to put up with this any longer. That in a sense that there's nothing left to, to lose. Even if you are that good girl, um, you're still not going to get the, the big prize. Mm -hmm. and, and so you might as well speak up. And I think that that is happening in the Me Too movement uh, about sexual harassment and the ways in which women have been demeaned as they uh, try to uh, make progress in careers from which they've been historically excluded, um, and the way in which uh, they have been uh, d sort of neglected and kept on the margins, um, yeah. uh, even if it's not in a, in a sexualized way. I want to talk a little bit about the antecedents to that, because I think we all agree the presidential election was a very big watershed moment in terms of gender dynamics. But um, you know, just last week, uh, the Cosby verdict came in. And no, I'm sorry, not last week. 
Yes, last yeah, week. Last Sorry. Week. Yeah, yeah. Time is like a river right yeah. now for me. Um, and the Cosby verdict came in, and it was Cosby trial take two. Take one was a hung, hung jury, and it came after New York Magazine put on its cover 35 women yeah. who said me too in 2015, and um, you know who had been silent for decades because they hadn't been given any kind of outside external or institutional validator. So there's, yes, the Hillary Clinton dynamic, but there's also, I think, what's interesting, sort of a choice that appears to have been made by institutional validators like the New York Times mm. and the New Yorker to suddenly be like, oh, actually, this is a story we're going to care about. Mm -hmm. And the way in which gender balance in newsrooms um, is also driving this because, I mean, in my, I'm a woman who straddles media and politics where uh, there's a lot of this behavior that's historically been treated with a big eye roll. So I want to talk a little bit, yes, about the grassroots energy that has produced this moment coming off the presidential campaign, its antecedents in Cosby, which we now see coming to fruition, but the fact that none of this was going to matter, really, frankly, until the New York Times put it on the front page in October. Mm. That's that's the that's when this Me Too sort of explosion is dated to, right. because right. it doesn't matter if you just sort of I think you've written about this, Geraldine. Like if you just say it to your friend, you have to you have to be heard on a larger yeah. platform. Mm -hmm. so please jump in. Well, uh, yeah. So so I, I would go back even further. Um, th you know, I think it's a, a mistake sometimes to think that this came out of nowhere. That it, it was announced in the New York Times in October 2016. Right. Um, I, I think uh, I think the beginning of this movement, to my mind, because I think what okay, so what makes the Me Too moment so revolutionary is that for the first time, women are being believed, um, and uh, and it is so powerful um, to see that. I mean, you know, even even Mitch McConnell said he believed the women who accused Roy Moore. I don't want to say that's a litmus test for women being believed, but <laughs> but no. So, but I would go back much further. I would go back to what the, the to, to someone who I believe is one of the bravest and most heroic women of the 20th century, and that's Anita Hill. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that what happened to Anita Hill when she spoke about what happened to her when she worked for Clarence Thomas, after the way she was vilified, a woman scorned, a little bit nutty, a little bit slutty, you remember right. this? They, the way what happened was women started talking to each other. They had a language. They, had, they began to say, this happened to me. My own mother, in November 1991, had did, called me to, to say, let's have dinner, because she wanted to tell me her story, which she had never told anyone. But finally, I think Anita Hill gave women language to talk about this. But every time women came forward publicly, they got vilified but they kept talking. So I think that, that that seed has taken 25 years to come to fruition. Then, as you rightly say, in October 19, uh, 2016, what happened? The Access Hollywood tape. That's what happened mm -hmm. on October 16th. And that, I think, led a lot of women to go, oh my God, this guy's confessing it. Yeah, I this just, will surely cost them I just, the election. I want to make the distinction between, I, you know, like here's the thing. Women have been screaming into the void for decades, mm -hmm. as you point out. The difference is they started to be heard. And I'm making, right. I think I, I kind of, the reason I edge away from that is a little bit is I almost don't want the onus to be on women to have to stand there and be like, that was fucked up. Am I the only one who thinks so? Like, mm -hmm. why is it up to women to have to say right. that? I, so I want to flip it to talk about being heard and the relationship between men now having to listen and figuring out what mm -hmm. to say in response. Mm -hmm. This is right. also something sure, sure. Where, where I want to shape the conversation towards that male in the, you know, in the Me Too dynamic. Sure. So can I ask, yeah. ask you a question? Yeah. So you brought up this issue of like why at, at the institutional level there seemed to be a tipping point. Do you think it's because there are more women uh, at, at higher levels I'm, in the institutions? There, there are more of them in positions of power and that, and that that helped so the I think voices it's a, being heard? I think it's a tricky question because, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about a tipping point, right? Well, if we have well, more women, then, then we'll have more <laughs> equality, right? But not all women are, 
you know, down for the equality mm-hmm. cause. Like we know all about game mm-hmm. girls who are sort of like in it to, mm-hmm. you know, pay, prop up the patriarchy because that's how they're going to advance. Sure. As a, and happy to do that at the expense of female mm-hmm. colleagues. And we know this because when we read about these stories about Matt Lauer or Charlie Rose, they like oftentimes there are women at work in these environments who both, some of whom are very senior and feel that it is not in their interest mm-hmm. to go to bat for women on the way up. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is, you know, I'm, there, we can talk about that sort of separately, but I, I do think that the question of whether or not getting more women in, into a space equals immediately equality is an open one, mm-hmm. certainly for me. But I, 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 I'm not suggesting that it, that it yeah. equals equality, but there, if there are more women in, in higher positions... Does it uh, help? I mean, that, 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 that it's... It is in, it's correlated with this change. I don't change. know. I think it's interesting that all of a sudden, you know, the times, again, this, this, we read this over and over in so many of the high profile stories that these were open secrets that mm-hmm. everybody mm-hmm. knew, yeah. which means there were bystanders. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, excuse me? Accomplices, mm-hmm. perfect language, exactly. People who were complicit. Um, and what I think I want to sort of, the people who felt comfortable with that, which is not, you know, whether or not these mm-hmm. are outliers or really the sort of banality of evil that Hannah Arendt has written so much about, the mm-hmm. idea that it, this wasn't like a singular, you know, event that happened and nobody knew about it and it was secret and deep and dark. It's usually been out in the open. So I, I do want to flip them to like, where, where does that put men now? Because I think we have this other part of the story about the backlash to Me Too, right? This mm-hmm. other narrative about how, like, well, men's lives are being destroyed. Mm-hmm. I would love to see some evidence of this. Um, you know, we see last week, page six, Charlie Rose is floating a pilot about interviewing men who've been ejected as a result of Me Too things. He's, of course, very much alive and rich and apparently talking about a television show. So I want to talk a little bit about that male, um, how men are coping. Mm-hmm. And uh, what then moving on to the role of men? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I do a lot of work um, in, uh, in in corporations and uh, mm-hmm. organizations about uh, and to try engaging uh, men to support gender equality. And, and what I think we hear constantly mm-hmm. um, is um, men are really confused. They are saying to their women colleagues and their friends, I don't know what to say anymore. Tell me what to say. Um, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. Have you heard this? Of, I mean, everybody has heard this. So, so I think this says, this says two things to me. The first is when they say, I don't want to offend anybody, I, you know, et cetera, I feel like, okay, this is a great place to start. What you're basically saying is you don't want to be a jerk That's a good place to start. The second thing is men are feeling uncomfortable in the workplace. And I think, okay, you know, women have been feeling uncomfortable for two millennia. Men have been feeling uncomfortable for two months. Okay, let's let's sit with this discomfort for a moment and sort of think through where it comes from and what it means. But the most important thing, I think, is that we keep asking women to tell us what to say. And I think that, that avoids the, the conversations that I think are necessary for men to have with other men. <clears throat> and by that, I mean quite simply what I was saying before about the good man, real man thing. It's about men challenging other men in those moments when they, when, when they, in, in, and not being, you know, okay with this because it's, we don't want to betray the brotherhood, but also men supporting one another in doing that because it is scary as hell to be the only one to challenge other guys, but if you have allies, you can do that. And this is, you know, th- th- that you, if you have somebody else who has your back, you can open up a space for others. I think that is a, a, a way that, um, that men need to be talking about this. Not asking women, but talking to each other about where this came from. So I agree also that, that it is a time when men don't know exactly what to say, but it's not stopping them, as you said, from saying stuff. And, <laughs> and, 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 and that in, in, in a way, it's the, the sort of self-silencing that women engaged in in, in, in these workplaces where they were uncertain of how they would be responded to, came out of a, a sense of insecurity that they might get thrown out. Um, they, uh, or they would get thrown mm-hmm. out if they, if, if, if they said too much or they asked for too, too much. But I'm not seeing this happening with uh, some of the, the men who have been uh, accused of, uh, of sexual harassment and more. Uh, that, that, that they're sort of apologizing 
uh, for if they had caused an inconvenience uh, to, uh, it, 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 to, to women in the past, but they're not really taking ownership uh, of their behavior and sincerely apologizing. Um, you know, it's interesting. I uh, teach um, at Columbia, but I also teach men in um, Sing Sing Correctional Facility, and I found that they are much more open and sincere in the way that they talk, they hold each other accountable for um, how they uh, have treated women in the past and how they want to do it in the future, and that, in a sense, there's more feminist ideals in there than, than there is outside, in part because they have had to take responsibility for actions that they've done, and they know how to take responsibility and to think about changing themselves. And so, you know, some of what, what's going on in the workplace with this kind of like pseudo apologies um, uh, that, that uh, we, we're hearing uh, with no acknowledgement of the behavior that has caused harm, uh, that, that there might take lessons from people who've been put in a position where they've had to take ownership uh, and apologize sincerely and take responsibility for their actions. You know, you both raised, there's sort of two things that come to mind just, um, you referred to the men who you work with who are incarcerated as, as having sort of more of a feminist understanding of ownership and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And Michael, you talk about uh, what, you know, creating a space in which men can have an emotional language to experience their feelings about all of this and process it. Um, and it, you know, which, you know, by the way, my friend has referred to at the beginning of the Me Too stuff, she's like, I can't talk to men anymore about what they need to do. Like, Michael Kimmel needs to open a series of drop-in centers <laughs> and just like run these things so men have a place to go. Shout out Danielle in the back. Um, but, you, but this idea of apologizing and, and talking about these feelings as being somehow fundamentally feminist, and just to go back to our idea of toxic masculinity at the beginning, I know, Michael, you eschewed a definition, but you once gave me one in a piece I wrote for the nation, which I'm going to bring back here, okay. which the headline of which was Andrew Cuomo's fragile masculinity. And you told me that toxic masculinity was an overconformity to dehumanizing ideas of masculinity, mm -hmm. meaning not talking about your feelings, not expressing these things. So essentially what Geraldine's proposing is that men incarcerated are in this feminist exercise of coming to mutual understanding and responsibility taking, and maybe men on the outside are slow mm. to do that. And I wonder, is there something, are we, are we talking about a feminist praxis of apologizing? It's, it's something I'm thought, sort of thinking about right now in general, mm -hmm. because the question of what now is coming up a little bit more. Like, what do we, mm. you know, what, what, we have these ridiculous, what I, you know, are called comeback stories, right? Mario Batali, what will he do? You know, like Charlie Rose, what's his future? Matt Lauer, like, I could care less about these rich guys who basically get golden parachutes. But the question of, I think, what the men, Michael, you're talking about, men who are not accused, mm -hmm. men in, who want to do the right thing, yeah. what to do in that space when maybe you don't have a language or that space to have the conversation, unless you're, Incarcerated and working with Charlie. I'm, I'm not. A, I'm not completely persuaded uh, by the, the the sort of the feminist consciousness in in prison. Um, partly because also men tell me that they have to steal themselves and be absolutely impervious in order to get through. Right. So that's not about talking about your feelings. That's about absolutely shutting down. Um, so I, I said the men that I teach. Okay, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, and yeah. Well, so so what does it say? Um, it to me it says that we are strategic about when we show vulnerability mm -hmm. and when we don't, and that we oh. know this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so my feeling is that's an emotional vocabulary, a kind of emotional right. facility mm -hmm. that we need to nurture. I completely, yeah. I, I, I'm not saying that this is wrong, and, but, but, that, but that men navigate their way through this. But here's a piece about the Me Too thing that I feel is un, you know, if you, we want to get to that place of accountability, apology, sort of truth and reconciliation, some model of this, it seems to me that we have to understand the position of so many of the men in this, in this, um, in this moment that are being accused. Because after all, if you see the, um, the, 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 the hidden variable, I, stay, I think sometimes in, me, in the Me Too moment, is age. Um, my father, my father's workplace looked like Don Draper's. 
And by that I mean all the men had the offices with the windows. And all of the women were gathered in a corral in the center known as the secretarial pool. And sexual access to them was a perk. The rules have changed. In, they are changing in real time. And so I thought, I grew up thinking that would be my world. But of course it isn't. My son, happily, 19 years old, freshman in college, doesn't think that that's in any way what the world he's going into. You know, he watched Mad Men with us and said, those people are smoking cigarettes in elevators. <laughs> they drink in the morning. Who are they? That's not my world, right? So, so, this, so I think what we're looking at is young people actually have a better understanding of these dynamics than older people do. They are far more comfortable with gender equality in their interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking in companies and thinking about reverse mentoring. Not the old people sort of helping the young navigate their way through, but the young people helping us figure out what actually these new rules mean. Because I think, you know, I'll, and I'll just tell you, I'm a, I'm a social scientist, it's my job, I have to do this. I'll give you some data. <laughs> So there was a survey in The Economist um, that came out in November that asked two groups of two cohorts of men, one 18 to 30 and one 62 and over. And they asked them three questions about like low level harassing behavior. They asked them, is it okay to call a woman sweetheart or honey? Is it okay to come up behind her and give her a neck massage? Is it okay to say, you look beautiful today? About 80% of the guys 18 to 30 said no, and about 75% of the men over 62 said sure. What, so I think that this variable, age, is a really, really significant one. And you notice that many of the men are being accused of things from 30 years ago. Tom Brokaw. Right. Right, this week. 15. Or last week, too. Yeah. Oh, no, Tom Brokaw, we had, we, we had news today. Oh no, yeah, yeah. There's, we can, There's some... you can catch up on it later, but don't worry. The, <laughs> the steady drip, drip of information continues on Tom Brokaw. So, um, are you talking please. about norms that are changing, and and so so that the young people or younger people are learning about how to interact across gender in, in different ways than, and and where where are those norms coming from? Well, first of all, I mean, I think that, that you know, it, it, partly the mm -hmm. argument that you made earlier that the, the, the entry of women into every arena in public life mm -hmm. has, um, has pushed, that, that's the sort of one of the drivers. But the other driver, I think the biggest change, at least wa watching my own kid grow up, grow up is, and, and I, I know this from, the, from uh, you know, national data, the biggest change in young people's lives is cross-sex friendships. Cross-sex friendships. You know, 25 years ago when I started teaching at, at Stony Brook, I would ask my students, how many of you have a good friend of the opposite sex? I'd get like 15% hands. Because 25 years ago, that was when Harry met Sally. Mm -hmm. Now, I could walk into any class, it, it, many of you know what I'm talking about, that early scene. So now I can walk into any class anywhere in the country and I can say, is there anyone here who doesn't have a good friend of the opposite sex? I never see a hand. I think that is the biggest change. And so, so what's the politics of that? Mm -hmm. Who do you make friends with? You make friends with your boss, you make friends with your, your subordinates? No, the word we use for friends is peers, equals. I believe young people have more in, experience with interpersonal gender equality than any generation that has ever walked on the face of the earth. This cannot help but be good. Right? It's going to reduce, I believe it's going to, it's, it's one of the drivers that's changing these norms because young people entering the workforce now, millennials who are coming into the workforce, they, they are much more adept at being colleagues, coworkers, accepting women you know, as supervisors. These guys are, are much more gender equal. You know, they're, the, mm -hmm. you, my son is her student, you know. <laughs> go, go, go. Um, I mean, it, 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 you know this. Yeah. It, it's, um. it's quite astonishing. You look like you want to say something. I, I do want to say something. Yeah, <laughs> please. But, it, but we've also seen um, efforts 
at the level of institutions to enforce rules um, mm -hmm. so, so, so that the kind of uh, sexual relations within the workplace that would have been accepted in the 60s are no longer, you're told explicitly that they're not accepted. Now, I'm, I'm raising this question because I don't know whether this is a good idea or not, that, uh, that we as employees or, or as supervisors are asked to, um, to let the office of so offices know uh, that there's something going on between people. This is uh, interesting. And, 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 and I, so I'm, I'm raising this because I actually have something to say about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, how I changed my mind. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was very skeptical of this, um, this enforcement of, of, of sexual relationships or, or, or absence thereof in institutions. I was, grew up in Ireland. I was taught by the nuns. The nuns were very good at regulating sexual behavior. <laughs> I, I hated that idea, and I never wanted to have to deal with it again or to worry about anybody's relationships. But one of my uh, colleagues who was a dean said, you know, it's really important for us to, to do this with, with our faculty or with, with, with anybody who comes new into our institutions because if they then sort of uh, don't know or, or misbehave in some way or other that comes to our attention, we can point out to them that we told you explicitly not to do this. So this is something that changed my mind about, um, about the way in which the, the institutions uh, should or could be helpful in in changing yeah. norms. I think that's so a that's good point. So this is interesting because mm -hmm. I think probably folks have seen in the subways these ads the New York City Commission on Human Rights is running that says it's just flirting, you know, and then mm -hmm. it says something like no, it's not. Report it. We believe you. Blah blah blah. And it's interesting because in the sort of Me Too discussion, there's sometimes this sort of like conflating of what's the difference between dating mm -hmm. and flirting and what's sexual harassment and what's inappropriate in a workplace. And, you know, Michael brought up the 60s and Mad Men and that, where, where there was no distinction. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's funny just because, to, in my mind, there is a very clear difference. And, and a lot of men, older men, to Michael's point about the age question, like, you know, Charlie Rose thought he was pursuing shared feelings with 21-year-olds, <laughs> which I just think is, you know, really, you cannot underestimate an old white man's powers of delusion to imagine he is a sexual or object. Of, or sense of entitlement. Or sense of entitlement. But, you know, this oh. idea that uh, you can, you know, you have a shot with a 21-year-old <laughs> because she would be actually desirous of you. Um, uh, but, but that, conf you know, a lot of these men brought up that confusion. You know, Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. said, well, I was, you know, came of age in the 70s, right, where, like, that was all, all cool and everything. And Michael, you've written about the new rules, like how there are these new rules now, and for older people, having to re-examine yeah. behavior that was once socially appropriate is now very confusing. And, the, and I just want to make the separation a little bit between policing mm -hmm. workplace romances that may form consensually and willingly, and I think the line that Me Too is trying to draw between the you know, use of power to gain access mm -hmm. to somebody in the workplace. And that, I think, is important to state. Mm -hmm. But I want to return back to something we were talking about, though, uh, which is we were t began to circle around this idea of apologizing and responsibility. Um, my cousin lives in Germany, and she shared with me a hashtag that's apparently trending there uh, ha called I did that among mm -hmm. men where they are now on social media, sort of preemptively and unprompted, confessing to behavior. Mm. And what strikes me about this is that it's not defensive. <laughs> it's an attempt to process what's going on in a public place and not hide from it or be silent about it. We don't really have an analog here. And I wonder if we could benefit from an I did that. Because I don't think the point mm. is, you know, we, we, Barry Diller was quoted in Maureen Down's column a few, weeks ago saying that right now the only answer to Me Too is capital punishment. The idea that like men losing their jobs is a death. Uh, again, he was referring to Charlie Rose, who's totally alive and rich and lives on the east end of Long Island. But this idea of hmm. what, how do you actually begin the process of reconciliation and what might that look like? Mm. Not how do we pretend none of this happened and sweep it under the rug, but, and not how does, it, does this make it go away, but what does that even 
look like? And Geraldine, you and I started to talk about this offline before. I'd love you to lead off yeah, on this. I, I talked about how in the, in the court system here, it's, it's very adversarial. You have a defendant, you have a prosecutor, and they try to, um, uh, the, the, the defendant tries to not um, own up to anything. And, and that kind of, and I think that th that takes place outside of the court system as well, that, that for somebody to say that they did it, um, uh, and, and it is, they're going to lose, they feel that they're going to lose everything, that they keep who they are uh, what they have, so long as they don't admit that they've done something wrong. Yet, in, in, in a lot of the research uh, that's been done, and some research that I did myself, where you know, I asked people um, if they had something unforgivable done to them, uh, uh, and what, what would it take uh, to forgive the person or to move on with the relationship? And they said, an apology. Um, and so it's not that a, a apology is the only thing that that's the solution, but it really is sort of a starting point. And in, if if you want to move forward, um, acknowledging uh, what 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 you've done um, is really the first step forward. Um, and in and and we know this in. Uh, marital uh, therapy in uh, relationships therapy that that's kind of what, what families need to do to, 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 to move forward but it would seem to me that that uh, from from the work that we do in restorative justice um, uh, that that this is a starting point but you have to have the courage to um, take what comes from that. The apology can be rejected. The person can still want you to uh, get the capital punishment. But, but, but you have to mm. break down your barriers and be ready to, to have the courage to take what comes. And I think that that's, not, that, that's what's not happening uh, with uh, a lot of the people who have been accused of um, mm -hmm. uh, sexual harm to others. No. Yeah, that we get a lot of these so, false apologies or extensive apologies mm -hmm. that then include a complete denial of everything at the end. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, men who've been accused by multiples of women then countersuing them. Yes. And right. the example you brought up to me off uh, stage was in the Cosby trial, he's been convicted. Uh, he's never once said, I'm sorry, or acknowledged it any wrongdoing or having mm -hmm. done anything, and there are 60 women who've come forward. And we were talking about, you know, for them, of course, it's, it's a huge deal that he's been convicted, but the thing they're not gonna get is an acknowledgement mm -hmm. from the person who violated them, and why that matters mm. in terms of a personal resolution. In, in that it just, it validates who you are and what you've done and what you've experienced. Right. And, I, I think that that is a starting well, point. I, do, I agree. I, I, I think um, I'm sort of wrestling with this because I've been, I, when I've talked with, with uh, men about this, um, they see the apology question more tra as transactional. Um, mm -hmm. If I apologize, then you have to say, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And why, why would it be, this is what they say, mm -hmm. why would it be in my interest to apologize and then have, get capital punishment. Mm -hmm. Why would it be in my interest to then be, you know, to, to then be marginalized? So obviously, I mean, and we're a country that's not really good on apologizing anyway, compared, especially compared to Germany. Um, so, no, I'm not it's joking about point. this. No, no, I think no, it's I'm a not great joking. point. Yeah, this is really, is, we, we have never, as a country, yeah. taken, a, taken responsibility for, for genocide. Um, we have never taken responsibility for slavery. We build monuments to slave owners. So, of course, um, we're, you know, so, but, yeah. but this idea that, that it's transactional. And Geraldine, when you said that, that you have to say it without an expectation of return, um, is, I think is the thing that, from, from, as I'm listening to you, I hear the men that I've been talking with say, I can't go there, I can't get there yet. That's the, that is, I think, the place that, that where we are being held, where we hold back. And I think what's interesting, I want to bring into this idea, because I was having this conversation and this, in anticipation of this panel uh, with my beau about, you know, why apologizing feels like losing. Like, mm -hmm. why is it a, a, a zero-sum game? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he made the observation that hadn't even occurred to me. He's like, well, I mean, that's like a national identity around here because, you know, it, before he was president, he who shall not be named accused Obama of repeatedly of apologizing to the world 
about America. He was always apologizing for America, this embarrass, the idea that he was embarrassed of America, that Michelle Obama was embarrassed of her country when she said, I can finally be proud. The idea that there was some sort of acknowledgement yeah. that we did something wrong and that that was us mm -hmm. losing face and lo losing period. And I think, Michael, you just brought a really critical point here is the, the way in which cultural and social identity is connected to their mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. of what apologizing means. Like I think of it as gaining in mutual understanding with someone. Uh, and you have to be, I think, you know, Geraldine made this point, regardless of outcome, you can't be attached to the outcome. It has to just be an act in and of itself. And you, Michael, make the point that, that we don't have a national uh, history of doing that. We don't have a cultural connection to that idea. <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to look to my um, uh, moderate, uh, institutional partner here and tell, cue me when it's time for Q&A, but uh -huh. we have actually, we all moved away from the understanding of this panel title as being about neuroscience, and we're, <laughs> we're focusing more on the mind and psychosocial aspects uh -huh. of it, but it's a great question. Um, I'll let so what what I didn't hear the first she part. was basically saying our, our men because of their are brains we wired for this are averse to apologizing and I was saying that we've chosen yeah. not to interpret this you know I think that we both agree uh, that that we're focused on the male mind here because there's no evidence really that the male brains and the female brains are different from one another and that that what what we're dealing here with is um, a construction of maleness and femaleness that, and, and a kind of an identity that um, is shaped by the context that we grow up in. Um, and, and that, that what I, I sort of, coming back to this idea that um, it's hard, it may be harder for men, in, at least in America, to apologize. Um, uh, be, be, is is the sense that they may not understand who who they are they, that that when when we work with people who seriously harmed others sort of men or women in prison we work with them first to understand um, how they came to do what they did and to have some sort of sense of compassion or understanding uh, for themselves and that that leads them to be much more able to take responsibility for apologizing and for really um, understanding uh, what they've done. So, so it's, it's sort of, to have somebody just apologize, like, because it's something that they're told to do today, I don't think works. I think you, what, what you do is help or work with men to understand how they've come to be who they are yeah. and in this society. I, so I think we have a really eager audience, and although I know we yeah, have five I, minutes obviously. more of talking, I think we should take some questions, because sure, clearly go. some of us are already ready to participate. So let's do it. Um, I saw a hand shoot up in the back, purple sweater. Sorry if I'm going to call you by your attributes. Purple sweater, um, uh, mustard sweater, gray sweater, and black sweater. Sorry, guys. And, and you can't ask a question if you're not wearing a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> just so happened, almost three out of four, you are in, are in cardigans, and Sorry, that's kind of hard to do. Purple sweater over here. Okay, got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, hi, my name's Allegra Fischel, and um, I'm the executive director of the Gender Equality Law Center, and I've litigated cases of sexual harassment for about 25 years, and I just wanted to make two observations. First, sexual harassment's about power. Mm -hmm. It's not about a compliment, you look nice, even a one-time touch on the back. It's about women saying no and men still doing it. I'm using women and men, although sometimes it can be men and men and women and women, and the LGBTQ community is also very vulnerable. But I just want to make clear, it's not about, in my opinion, men being confused. It's generally pretty clear-cut. And some of the things that still happen, like as of today, are shocking. They're not compliments misconstrued. They're very assaultive, threatening language and acts. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say is in 25 years of litigating cases and working with thousands of women, not one of them, mostly in the workplace, mm -hmm. have ever wanted an apology. Mm -hmm. That's not what they want. Mm -hmm. They want it to stop. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have their jobs threatened. They don't want to be pushed out of their jobs. Mm -hmm. And they want it made right. 
But they don't, it's not a personal relationship. That's a they fair point. They don't want mm -hmm. an apology. Yeah. I'm yeah. not okay. saying no woman doesn't, no. Yeah, yeah. but none of them that I've ever worked with. I think we're musing about apology, and that's a, such yes, a relevant I'm, point. About, I like an apology Yeah, yeah, yeah. From, but, you know, but my yeah, husband. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's not what, yeah. what makes yeah. this yeah. go away. And I'm, I'm not, not anti-male. I happen to be married no, to I'm, I'm not saying that, that an apology is all people want, but in, 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 in order to, they, that, that many people People want an acknowledgement that uh, that this did happen to them, yes, and th that's what I, in a sense, I <laughs> probably is a prelude to, to an apology. Yes. But I would also agree with you that power uh, is is at the heart of this, and there's quite a lot of. Um, psychological studies that show this sort of misattribution of power, of power when, pe when um, people in power are interacting with people in lower power, they, uh, they misinterpret um, uh, 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 signals of positivity as signals of attraction. And, and when they themselves are threatened, they may, uh, in particular, when, when, when they're, they're aroused, they see uh, the other person as being uh, attracted to them. I mean, there's a very famous study that, that was done, and it, it's, it's not a, a power study, but of, uh, in the, I think it was back in the 70s, of men on, on a suspension bridge, and uh, they were jumping up and down, and they saw a woman, and they felt that she was more attracted to them uh, than if they were not on the suspension bridge. So it's, it's, it, this is... <laughs> Uh, by our turn, okay. but but by your former colleague at, at, at Stony Brook, but it, but it is this uh, because I, what's really puzzled me is um, the so, the way in which Harvey Weinstein and some others have said, well, you know, I thought that that it was mutual. Many others have said that, and and it sort of helps to understand uh, the way in which uh, power. Uh, can be uh, and, and power dynamics can be misinterpreted in as a yeah. sexual. Uh, I, I want to say something very quickly about this because, as you say, that you have spent your your life working to prosecute cases mm -hmm. that are, of course, the most egregious ones. I mean, we know what percentage of women report. We know what percentage of women actually get to trial. So, uh, what I want to say though is there that is that what we've been talking about is a continuum that mm -hmm. ends in your courtroom but begins. Mm -hmm a lot earlier and the danger of thinking categorically that if it's not does it rise to the Harvey Weinstein or or Bill O'Reilly monstrosity then we let ourselves off the hook since I didn't do that what I'm doing with yeah. my with my colleague doesn't really count that's dangerous I think what what, what I think that the me too moment is saying is we have to look at the entire range of, of, of this continua because some people will find, make, be uncomfortable by things that others may not be. And thus the kind of, you know, the kind of draconian, okay, here's the, sort of, here's the red line, you cannot cross it, mm -hmm. because, because we don't know how individuals in, you know, differently situated are going to experience the same or similar behavior. Thank so I, I think that continuum is very important to keep in mind yes. because that keeps us men from opting, taking the individual opt-out option. That's a good point, too. We'll take another question. Um, hello, Jamila here. Um, I had a question basically brought up by um, Michael. I believe you made the point that there was a generational dynamic happening here and that you know it seems that there's progress potentially in the male mindset in the younger generations. But I really wanted to maybe challenge that a little bit and just ask how you reconcile that against the additional recruitment that's happening in the incel community, um, in the white supremacist community that also really dovetails quite a bit with misogyny and with the entitlement to sexual access um, that that is also very much recruiting amongst young men. Um, so, you know, thinking about this generational dynamic and, and other things such as other Me Too stories like Aziz Ansari where people are talking about what is the role of female pleasure in a society that now okays hookups and, and to some extent young men aren't really taught about equally valuing women's sexual experience and pleasure um, 
in, in their interpersonal reactions, um, or rather interactions. So just generally wanted to hear your thoughts about how you reconcile what's happening in the young male brain today that might be leading to both of those dynamics yeah. that we're seeing actually increase um, amongst them. Well, uh, you know, I could not agree more. Um, it's a good advertisement for my book, Angry White Men. Um, <laughs> and and I, because, I, because, you know, there, uh, but I, I have a couple of comments about it. I think I wasn't suggesting for a minute that one, type, one sort of arrangement has totally replaced another. I do think they exist side by side. Um, I think that there has been an increased backlash because of the progress made by formerly marginalized groups. And I think we see that around race, sexuality, gender, uh, you know, in so many different areas. So, uh, so I do think that that's, uh, that, um, that that's, you know, that they're, that they're running on sometimes parallel and sometimes converging tracks. The second thing I would say is that you, you said what I consider to be the key word, which is entitlement. Um, I think that the, you know, um, the, the incel movement, which now everybody, knew, you know, you didn't know about this two weeks ago, um, you know, or the, how about the MGTOWs, you know about the MGTOWs, men going their own way. Uh, they've had bad experiences with women over the years, and so now they will just, they took, you know, they just swear off dating relationships, et cetera, with women. Um, you know, and, and, the, and the men's rights activists, and you, you know, you know about Gamergate. You know, so th there's a lot of policing. There's a lot of community building on the internet. Um, I do think that in, in many respects, their numbers are smaller than their volume. But I do think that this is a significant issue, and the issue that I talk about is what I call aggrieved entitlement. They believe that they are entitled to certain things because they played by all the rules that they thought they were given, and now they're not getting what they were supposed to get. And so, you know, so um, uh, you know, the, the uh, Alec Manassian is that his name mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in Toronto is uh, is this ver you know is this is this a decade's version of Elliot Rodger in Santa Barbara, who was last decade's version of George Sodini. You may remember him. Mm -hmm. um, killed a, a, had not had a date or uh, in, in uh, 10 years, had not had sex in seven years, blamed women, thought he was really good looking and thought he should be dating, but he couldn't find a date. So he walked into an aerobic studio in Pennsylvania and opened fire, killed eight women and then himself. Um, so this is, you know, this every, and, bl and left a suicide note saying, if, you know, basically if you put out more, I wouldn't have had to do that, have to do this. We, you know, so that's what that's that agreed entitlement. I completely agree. That is what I think underlies a lot of the re reaction to this. Um, I tend to be because I'm an activist. I believe change is possible. Because I'm a professor, I'm an optimist because I believe that my students will have better lives if they can critically engage with their world. So I tend to focus on the the more positive parts. But I definitely, I mean, I wrote that book which really depressed me about, about because I, I, mean, I, I mean, at the end of the book, I was talking to neo-Nazis and white nationalists, the Char your Charlottesville alt-right people. Before they were alt-right, they were simply violent extremists. Um, so I mean, I, you know, so I, I, I spent some time listening and talking to them because I wanted to, to sort of write about exactly that issue. So, thank you. We had another question mm -hmm. here. Uh, in the middle, gray sweatshirt with her one finger up. I had called on her originally. Okay. You can wave, maybe. I'm or, coming. Or, right, right there. Right there. I got it. Here. Ah, University of Chicago, my alma mater. Um, so similar to your question, oh. Jamila, um, I was curious what your thoughts are on men who are not involuntary celibate. You know, that sort of, I would call more fringe and might give lip service to feminism but are still assaulting women and are still protecting boys' clubs. Um, oh. I'm wondering what about younger men who are more likely to recognize what sexual harassment is, but then might still do it, um, and how we might have a sexism today that just kind of has the veneer of being politically correct, but is still yeah. entrenched in these systems of power. And I'm very suspicious that my peers are going to just give up these systems of power, which will enable them to do well if they're just going to say, Oh yeah, you, we were wrong. You know, that just seems very. Yeah. So, so to, just real quick, for I want a uh, quick shout out to your point. 
stay tuned for a piece from Danielle Chalakian about just the kind of total undercover woke bro who is assaulting <laughs> women and knows better, quote unquote. Just a little yeah. shout out there. Good. I'll let these guys go on. So let me just say, do, do you think that, they, that the guys that you're talking about have a... Um, are complacent that everything that, that everything else is going right for them. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that you know what you were talking about were guys on on the fringe and it and, and, and are rejected in in a lot of ways and or at least feel rejected and then they reject each other. I mean that that, that if you look at, at what goes on in those um, chat rooms or whatever they're called now, it, it it's really nasty and so they, they can never feel comfortable. Um, and that, that's at least the uh, Elliot Rogers, uh, which is the case that I know more about. Um, that was a horrible atmosphere. But I, what I'm wondering is, are you talking about men who feel sort of, comp young men who feel like they're in fraternities and well accepted, um, uh, and that they, they can do what they want, mm. and they have a brotherhood that <coughs> keeps them together, or are they in other ways fragile? Clarify for us. <laughs> I'm just thinking about like, the majority of men, the kind of men who went to the women's march, who have a cousin that went to the Oh, I love that you think mm. that's the majority of men. Yeah, really. <laughs> Amazing. Mm. Like, Optimism. A certain milieu. Of in, in blue states. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So, like, what about the, the woke, the all, everyone who says the right thing affects the right feminism? Uh -huh. And, like, what about mm -hmm. that guy who's maybe secretly assaulting someone? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the question, right? Yeah, virtue signaling, uh -huh. signaling right? The, the yeah, sort sure. of feminist who's, male mm -hmm. feminist who's virtue signaling, but mm -hmm. not actually practicing a feminist, like, uh, politics whatsoever. Yeah. Okay, does that clarify? I think that clarifies it. Yes, so it, it's very interesting, because one of my students uh, talked about somebody like, th like that, who, who then went on and uh, became a leader, and was very abusive to women. And this, this sort of, um, what do you call, in, uh, inauthentic leadership, um, as distinct from authentic leadership. So uh, with the authentic leadership being somebody who knows themselves and knows um, what, what their true feelings are about uh, women. So it's, it's in a sense that they're, they're what, what they're saying with their mouth or with their brain, um, uh, with their cognition, is very different from how they feel. And they end up objectifying or, um, women and doing what they want while they're sounding like say, saying the right thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think that that is a real danger. And you know, in a sense, more of a danger than, um, uh, than what, what you are talking about, sort of men on the fringe who are fringe within their fringes. I also wonder, it's interesting, because I think that there's maybe, I understand that as generational for younger mm -hmm. people because we're so caught. Social media is such a factor that didn't really exist before. Mm -hmm. There is a culture of virtue signaling where mm -hmm. you get on Twitter, sure. you get on Facebook, and it's very important to broadcast your politics and where you are and say the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that disconnect, I think, yeah. be, is something mm -hmm. that is measurable then, right? Yeah. And that's what you're talking about. I completely get it. And it's interesting because it's a phenomenon that, that may be, in fact, amplified by social media and the seeming pressure to be like, okay, I'm, I'm seen here. I'm, in, I'm on Instagram with my, like, whatever T-shirt, yeah. signaling the right intention, the right politics. Am I actually practicing mm -hmm. it? It's a different question entirely. Uh, well, I, I, I have a, a, a couple of, uh, of different reactions. First of all, I completely understand this. You know, I also feel that there's, um, that we, you know, that this is not an either or phenomenon. People are enter this, um, this process and I think they will, you know, that many of them will revert to previous behaviors. Many of them will sort of try out new behaviors. I'm not, I'm not as worried about this as you are, um, partly because, um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, I, when, I, when I was doing my, my most recent uh, work, I, um, I saw a cartoon of a Klansman uh, a drawing of a Klansman with, you know, full-on robes, talking to someone, and he's saying, well, actually, I'm more of an off-white supremacist. 
And I thought, okay, so there's a, there's a kind of you know, mainstreaming uh, element here. I also think um, that one of the things that Geraldine said that, that I think that this is really important is that's why we have rules in our institutions. Because I have witnessed the phenomenon that you describe every time I lecture on college campuses, which is often because I wrote that book, Guyland, which is about men 16 to 26, so it's college age. And so here's what I witness, and I think that this is really, I think you're, you're right, and there is a certain complacency behind the virtue signaling in public. Mm -hmm. If you look at a, a, a college classroom during the day, I don't think there's a more gender equal place in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, mm -hmm. everybody sort of knows how to gender their pronouns and they, they all say the right thing and they might have even gone to the library and read a black feminist and because it was on the required reading list. And, if, and one of the things you'll notice is they all dress alike. They're wearing sweatshirts and t-shirts and jeans and sweatpants and flip flops and running shoes. At night, however, the guys are still dressed exactly the same. And the women are wearing short skirt, crop tops, lots of makeup, and heels. Now, it is axiomatic in anthropology that you can read power by who dresses up for whom. So what I would say to you is by day, these guys are saying the right thing, doing the right thing. But at night, they can just relax because that's when they rule. That's the paradox I tried to understand in Guyland. But I think that, so you, what, you're, what you're getting at is a certain amount of complacency. All I have to do is sit back and eventually they will come to me because I am entitled. And that's where, as Geraldine says, institutional arrangements that make new rules will, will get some of these guys to say, well, you can't do that any longer. You can't do that here. And here's the payoff. The men that I talk with who are, who are taking parental leave, who are in, more involved in family life, which, you know, men are doing more, well, not so much housework, but childcare than ever. Um, we used to think of them as housework and childcare, but now we think of housework and childcare. Um, uh, but I think that men are actually finding that they kind of like it. They kind of like more gender equal relationships in the end. I think that's, so ultimately I think these institutional constraints mm -hmm. are, are part of this and I think the, uh, the, the, the attraction, the carrot will be that they actually will be happier. This it's a topic we could go on forever on. It's so interesting. I want to though honor our navy blue cardigan, who I had originally called on, who is our <laughs> fourth questioner. And then um, I just think for the sake of balance, we got to take some men, ladies. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sorry, so I'm going to get give that guy a chance. <laughs> and this one. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Skyler. Um, I just want to say that I thought the point of incarcerated men, mm -hmm. sort of having a system of accountability that we don't see sort of outside um, to be a really interesting one, um, not only because of what Michael said about, you know, there being a lack of choice and how people comport themselves, but I also thought it was fascinating because women are not present and in the outside world mm -hmm. there is such heavy reliance mm -hmm on women to do emotional labor Such for men. Mm -hmm. So where Such women are not point. present to do that labor, yeah. what it looks like when mm -hmm. men have to start doing it for themselves mm -hmm. and doing it for each other. So sort of thinking about, well, how do we take that? And there's still so much reliance on women in all facets, in friendships, in families, in work relationships, personal relationships, intimate relationships for mm -hmm. at least when people are choosing to identify as men and women for the person identifying as a woman to be doing all of that labor and how do we push that labor where it should be, which is on mm -hmm. men to do for mm -hmm. themselves so it's not just looked at as, well, how do women support men in not terrorizing us? Um, uh -huh. <laughs> and, yeah. and also sort of taking away, because I feel like sometimes when we're having conversations about power dynamics, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a prerequisite of, well, you have to say what you want, and what you want is equity, but like I only care about hearing that you want equity if you say it to me in a nice mm -hmm. way. So mm -hmm. when, as we are putting this <laughs> labor back on men to hold uh -huh. themselves and each other right. mm -hmm. accountable, how do we balance 
the desire to have men share their feelings while also pushing back and saying people's equity, their equality, their safety, their happiness should not be predicated on you feeling fine about it. Mm -hmm. um, just because I feel like that makes its way into so many different conversations. And so mm -hmm. how do we give people room to talk and reflect, but also remove that as a thing off the table? Like nobody should have to earn equity or prove mm -hmm. that they're mm -hmm. worthy of that. So how do we sort of push the labor back and how do we take off the sort of, well, if you work hard enough and you do this just right, like maybe oh. uh, pick a terrible thing, like you won't deserve to have that happen. All right. <laughs> well, I, th I think you've brought up questions that are at the heart of the matter and, and I mean it, as you were as I was talking about the men in prison I was thinking the same thing that they are they are doing the emotional work in, in my class <laughs> and, and not, not that I recommend prison in general but but yeah. but, but, that, but, that, but that, that, that they take it on themselves to do this um, and I would say in part because it's, it's, the, the women are not there, but they have had you know, very supportive mothers um, and that that's who they're thinking about mm. uh, and wanting to do better uh, uh, for. Uh, um, and, but but, but to, to, that is probably the, one of the few gendered places where men talk about their emotions. Um, and I think that you're right, finding more ways of doing that. But also that nobody should have to ask for equity or ask not, certainly not ask nicely for equity. Uh, and and that, that I, I don't know other than to agree with you that that should be taken off the table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, Michael said something interesting that goes to right to the heart of what you said I mean, I, that I've thought more and more about in my own time, which is that like, you know, women have been like dealing with this stuff for centuries and men have had like two months of discomfort or whatever it is. Um, that idea of like being able to sit with discomfort. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just like a basic, you know, stage of development, like psychological development, <laughs> you know, like you actually pass through a phase of like dealing with discomfort and living through it and breathing through it and whatever. Mm -hmm. I, that's just like such a fascinating point. Like you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be comfortable. And and it's it's got I, I don't I think that's so key like I so, I got so enraged I think it was last week Glenn Thrush who's at the New York Times and who was you know briefly suspended and then basically quote unquote demoted from the White House beat to covering social services as if that's a demotion uh, and you know all the women who cover that beat are like thanks for this do you have to sit next to now he like tweeted and he's very cautious on Twitter he tweeted something last week uh, kind of shouting out to New York area reporters for their work on something he's like you know, this lead, like, give me a good lead, and I'm a happy man. And I just thought, no one cares about your happiness. It is not about your happiness anymore. Mm -hmm. And, like, that idea, he had, again, centered his pleasure. And I love that it goes back to Jamila's point, the centering of, like, whose pleasure and whose mm -hmm. comfort is really what we're talking about here. Like, who gets to have a good time? Who gets to be happy? Who can be... Like, and, and, and understanding that like maybe we all can be and that it's not a one up, one down position, which is where I think we get into that like screwed up concept of apologizing as losing. Mm -hmm. So that's something I think is the negotiation we're going through culturally right now is like, can we be, can we be sometimes uncomfortable and then, you know, can some people who've never been comfortable have a, you know, five mm -hmm. minutes? Yeah. I don't know. But this, I, I think this speaks to uh, sort of the, the, the basic fundamental moral question, which is this isn't, um, you know, I make the case that, you know, that gender equality is in men's interest, that we'll have a better life. But, but the truth is the, the real reason why men should support gender equality is because it's right, period, full stop. Right. You know, it's right, it's fair, it's just done. You know, if it makes us, if it puts us out a little bit, if it makes us a little bit uncomfortable, okay. It's but a crazy it's radical right. notion. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it's a basic fundamental citizenship question. It's mm -hmm. not a question, you know, so this guy saying, well, you know, this makes me happy. Well, I'm glad that that is the byproduct of this, but it's, it, it should not be the, the, the driver. I was not glad. I, <laughs> I thought his happiness was too soon, but, but point taken. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a gentleman over here, this guy over here, and then this gentleman in the front. 
I have to leave at eight. Hi. Oh, okay. Um, and we have, a, I, we have a hard stop at eight, so we're gonna wrap it up fast here. Okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, white racism recently, reading a lot about whiteness and white people's role in confronting other white people, about white supremacy. And when I am thinking and reading about that, I'm often drawing the parallels with masculinity and patriarchy, right, and sexism. So same thing happening during this conversation where I just keep thinking about all the parallels with racism. So I was just wondering if y'all had any mm-hmm. like thoughts on where the parallels are and where there are unique things about masculinity and maleness um, that make it distinct from the patterns we've seen in the history of white supremacy in this country. So actually, this is very interesting that you were bringing it up because when you were talking about um, equity, uh, gender equity, I was also thinking about racial equity because that is the other unaddressed issue in this country and um, I don't know what the parallels are um, directly, but, but, but I think that what's really important is to think uh, more broadly about making everybody uh, equal, and especially really addressing um, uh, racism in this country, because sexism really can't be addressed without racism being addressed also. Mm-hmm. And, and to, to think about how we might want all of us um, uh, who are in privileged positions be willing to give up something in order for others to be to feel treated and to be treated more more equally. With respect, so, quickly to Michael's time, mm-hmm. I'm just going to jump in and say and add white women to that because yeah, sure. um, I just think it's really key here that. I think the parallel is feeling better than someone. And Mm -hmm. when we talk about, like, you know, Geraldine has talked about equity. We've heard a lot about it from questions from the audience. Uh, You know, not everybody is going for equity and equality. And Michael said, like, that's just because it's the right thing to do. But most people want to be better than someone. And we saw that 53% of white women voted for somebody who uh, valued them only for their racial privilege. So I, I think it's that feeling of wanting to be superior. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that, and I, I want to be sensitive to time, and I want to be sensitive to the last question over here, but you tell me what you need. Um, I, I, no, I, I would say that yeah. you know, this is a parallel, this is a, a construction that I work with a lot. I think about the ways in which it works, and I find, I find race very often, uh, whiteness, very often very difficult for white people to talk about. Um, um, uh, my friend Harry Kondabolu often talks about when white people talk about race, they, you, know, you get an equation. You know, like I'm 30% German, I'm 20% Irish, you know, 1% Native American for college applications. So that, and that's his, that, and I have found the same thing. I tried very hard, you know, having done, you know, men's groups and talking about this stuff for years, I tried to have a whiteness group to talk about white privilege with my white friends. And our first meeting, you know, um, someone said, well, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm Italian, I, I'm not really white, you know. And another one said, well, I'm Irish, you know, and the British called us black, so I'm not white. And I said, well, I'm not, I'm Jewish, I'm not white. Suddenly, like, there were no white people in the room. I think it is very hard for the center to stay in the center and examine what privilege feels like when you're in the center. I, and so, so I, 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 I take your point, I honor that, that intersection, it is absolutely critical, and it is a conversation that we white people need to have. Wait, word. Mm-hmm. This uh, man over here. Hang on. Thanks. Um, so, thanks for everything you've shared. Um, I wanted to go back to this question about toxic masculinity um, and constructing, uh, I know we, I appreciate the critique of the term, um, but I think that it's really important to be talking about what uh, uh, masculine or male humanity is um, and whether there is something there that is more than just humanity. Um, In men's groups that I'm in, we're constantly circling around this question. um, And we can talk all day about, you know, the way that being told what our sexuality is and what makes us valuable, you know, like, I mean, I can talk all day about how, like, that has fucked me up and, like, pursuing the things that that I was told were valuable for me has, like, pulled me away from what is my true humanity, but, like, is there, is, is the alternative to toxic masculinity, acknowledging the critiques, just, like, being a person, or is there some, like, uh, is there something else in there? Great question. 
you want to take well, that? Well, you know, um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, because I don't, I, I, I find the toxic idea sort of difficult because, um, uh, but obviously there are many things that, I mean, you know, so here's, what, here's the way I would, I would say it. I, yeah, yes, of course, just as we were saying, racism, you know, fucks white people up too. S patriarchy mm -hmm. is, is a dual system of power, right? It's the power of men over women as groups, but it's the power of some men over other men which answers the paradox that, that patriarchy empowers men and men don't feel powerful, right? Because it's also about, uh, it's about men's power over other men, uh, about a lot, uh, uh, for a lot of other reasons, race, class, sexuality, age, et cetera, all kinds of reasons. So, so my feeling is that we have been sold an idea about what masculinity is and what it means. And we are, uh, my, my real man, good man thing is like, we're, we're having that conversation in our heads all the time. We're constantly policing ourselves if we're not being policed by others um, about how we move, how we walk, how we talk, everything. So my feeling is that, that we, need, you know, we need a place where we can talk about the damage that has been done to us in the name of, of our masculinity. It's not women's job to take care of that, right? We've got to talk about that, that you know, the, the pain, the, the, the threat of violence, the trauma that men have experienced mm -hmm. for that relentless policing that starts so young. That's the conversation I think we need to have. On that note, <laughs> thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the Brooklyn Historical Society. Thank you for coming.